Pardon the interruption. I'm Dan Sharris in No Terrorist Attacks is going to end PTR. Pardon the interruption. I'm Jared Boyer. That's true. Uh, again, our thoughts go out to all the people affected in Boston, just about 45 minutes away from here, 45 minutes to an hour, close to where both of us are from. So our thoughts and prayers go out to those people affected in that uh, tragic event. All uh, right. Less tragic here. Let's get right to topic number one. All right, so so sticking with the marathon explosions going down, we actually happened to be right next to each other. We had class, yeah, and that's how I found out it was from you. What's your take on the situation? I think it's the same as everyone else's. I think in the world, it's an awful situation. It's unfortunate that an event, uh, it's a celebration. It's a great time for everyone in Massachusetts. Obviously, if you're watching this in Rhode Island, Patriots Day in Massachusetts. Everyone's off from work. Everyone's off from school. Everyone gathers at. Uh, you know, has a great time down in Boston. I've never been to the to the marathon. I've watched it a few times on TV. Obviously, had school off. It's a great time. So it's just a shame that an event like that gets is going to be marred by this. And then come next year, the question is, it, the the security is going to be ramped up. Are you going to be able to have the same same great time? Maybe, maybe not. Just a shame all around. Yeah, it really kills the vibe. Yeah, like, I mean, not just about the Boston Marathon, but anything going forward, any sort of sporting yeah. event, any event that people are just hanging out, you know? I mean, this is what people do. They just hang out. I mean, yeah. you know how crazy it is to run a marathon? It's like tw 26 miles. I mean, that's a lot of running. you got to have a big-time commitment. And for something to happen like that, it's just, it's just awful. I mean, looking on the bright side, though, I mean, the bomb went off, and I would have thought more than – three people so far have been killed by it. Yeah. I mean, it's probably going to be more coming along. Uh, I heard 17 were in critical condition. Yeah. So, I mean... You're hoping you're hoping that number stays at three. Yeah, that's it's it's not... It, it looks like there would be a worse... Yeah. Worse uh, death toll, I would yeah. guess you would say, from the explosions. Uh, just hopefully this person gets caught and or persons. Yeah. And, I mean, they're going to they're gonna pay for it. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to yeah. them, but, I mean... They're not going to want to show their face in public because everyone's going to be after them. Yeah, the city, the city, and this region of the world is really fired up now, and as it should be. And it's a response you would expect from Boston, as uh, President Obama mentioned. Tough-minded people in and around the Boston area. I am not from Boston. I'll never claim to be from Boston. I've been there like six times, but as a Massachusetts resident, I'm not from Boston either. I've hung yeah. out on Boylston Street, that, that area. I yeah. get off the train right there. I try to walk you know I'm a walker you know I like to walk experience the city not take the subway but I mean a subway a terrorist attack I don't know I mean that happened in London a few years ago yeah. I mean that would cause some serious trouble it's so easy to access that like get on the subway there's no yeah. security there and yeah. then if under the subway if something happened I mean mayhem you saw what happened when it was outside in the streets I yeah. mean in the subway you just you don't know what's gonna happen yeah because you know some another subway could come I mean they don't know what terrorist attack could happen. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying that that would be devastating. Yeah, you better hope FBI agents don't watch that. But <laughs> let's get they, they know they know some ways. Yeah, probably. I know. Uh, I know. Under All right, next topic. Next topic. Next topic. Possibilities. All right. So the question is, how will Boston sports re respond? Beast play tonight. C's game got canceled yesterday, not to be rescheduled by the NBA. What's the response? I mean, the response, we saw the Red Sox last night. They had the, the jersey hanging up in the dugout, 617, Boston Strong. I mean, everyone's going to rally around this. Yeah. Sports in general is just the greatest place to for, for relief, I guess you would say, to get back to normal. I mean, we saw what happened after 9-11. Even a couple years ago, 10-year anniversary of 9-11 was on the first week of the NFL season. So celebrations galore happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what sports does. I mean, it's going to bring people together. Everyone's going to feel good about themselves again. I mean, obviously you remember what happened in the past. But tonight, Bruins back at it. I don't know what kind of celebrations they have in store, but usually these Boston teams know how to celebrate stuff stuff like this, you know. And then uh, Renee Rancourt, guy's pretty much awesome in general when he does the National Anthem. Tonight, he's probably going to knock it out. Yeah, that's going to be uh, an emotional moment. I think the entire crowd is going to get into that. That'll be probably the the after the attack. That'll be like the next biggest like moment connected to this event. It will be this national anthem. Uh, it's going to be a big deal. The place is going to be rocking all all afternoon. You'd expect the bees emotionally charged come out probably win this game. Sabers aren't that good anyway, so expectation is the Bruins will win this game. Probably 
will probably pick their play up, to be honest with you, as the season goes on, because now you see it all the time. New Orleans did happen there. You know, Joe Andrewsy with the Pats, they ended up winning the Super Bowl. He took inspiration from 9-11, all that stuff. So I'd expect the, the Bs to make a run. The Cs are old, but they'll probably play a little better for a little bit, and then that won't happen. Like, they'll run out of steam, but there'll be a little boost, and it, it should, it'll just be good to kind of get back to normalcy a little bit in Boston, starting with the Bs game. And then moving moving forwards because that's the next step. It's just moving on. It's trying to move on uh, for those of us who It'd weren't affected. Awesome. For the people who were affected, obviously, you can take as much time as you want. But if you weren't affected, you know, honor those people. Think about it. Pray for them. And then you just got to move on. That's that's all you can do. Let's get to topic number three. So warehouse, we saw what happened on Sunday. We were all rah rah masters. Yep. Delivered again. What do you got to say about that? I am, first I'm going to say, I don't think it did deliver, to oh, be honest with okay. you. okay. All right then. The last couple years has been the entire round has been great. From the first tee shot they show to the very last putt that drops, the Masters has been phenomenal. This year, Sunday, first of all, was atrocious. Awful weather for one. No well. one was making putts. Nothing was really going on. No one made a charge. No one really stepped up until the last hole where Adam Scott makes that birdie putt, but Jason Day was in control of the tournament. He makes two bogeys in a row. So it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same year, the Charles Schwartzel year, where there was a pack of guys at 10 under. It looked like you could get a playoff with four, five, six guys. And it wasn't just four, five, six no names. Tiger, Luke Donald, big name guys like that were in the mix. Adam Scott, Jason Day were in the mix that year as well. And then Schwartzel comes out, birdies all those holes in a row. You didn't we, even know who that guy we was. We saw the boy. playoff with I had heard of Charles Sports well, before. Pretty good, uh, pretty decent talent on the European tour. But um, the year before, like, the year that Angel Cabrera won, three-player playoff, that was unbelievable. I mean, the Masters Sunday, usually from start to end, and then you had last year, Us Hazen making the double eagle. His, you know, then he kind of faltered a little bit. Bubba Watson coming back, that great shot. So the playoff, the putt on 18, great. The second shot in from Cabrera on 18 was great. And then the playoff itself was really solid golf. So that was good, but as an entire Sunday, I would give it like a C. I thought it was pretty average at best. Well, I mean, maybe we've been spoiled by great Masters Sundays, but eventually Sunday, Sunday, like you said, was awful. I mean, I was looking forward to it, and I was like, all right, we got three Australians. Angel Cabrera, who I thought was just awful, going down. I mean, the guy, the guy looks like he's 50. He looks like he should be on the senior PGA Tour. Just throws everything into his shot. Just awful swinging. I'm like, oh my god! Has John Sutcliffe has most his of these, translated? Most of these guys on the PJ Tour to begin with don't have the best looking swings, but it works. So, yeah. So I was like, I didn't want on Hill Cabrera win, especially because he won already. I'm like, all right, had enough of that guy. So I was rooting for Brant Snedeker. Turns out that guy did terrible, played a terrible round. Tiger Woods ends up finishing top American. We'll get into him later. So that from that aspect, I was I, I like to root for the Americans. You know that, any sport pretty much. And then, so going from there, the playoff, I mean, Scott versus Cabrera. I was happy that Scott won it instead of somebody hitting a bad shot. Yeah. Because I mean, Cabrera, Cabrera parred both holes, yeah. whereas Scott had to hit a good shot in the second playoff hole. And I was happy that I was happy that Scott won. Yeah. Got a big win. Finally, big win in the yeah. guy's career. I mean, yeah. he's, he's been around for like 10 years now. Yeah. And he's still young. He's 32. So I, I was pleased with that. And I was pleased with the finish the day, like you said, Pretty, yeah, uh, the finish pretty was not great. awesome. But the finish was great, yeah. From the putt on 18 forwards, it was awesome. Everything yeah, before yeah. that was not that great. Because cause Scott hit that shot, and then Cabrera answered right back. Yeah. Because Cabrera had to see it. Yeah. So that was nice. Yeah, that finish was awesome, but day in itself, like to see. Finish A+. Plus. I will I would say that. Okay. All right. Next topic. So the question on everyone's lips was, should Tiger have gotten the boot? after his illegal drop on day two, which pretty much cost him the tournament. When you look at it, actually, the thing that cost him the tournament was hitting the flag. If he doesn't hit the flag, that goes to about two feet. He probably makes that putt. Probably ends up winning the tournament, but what do you think? Should he have got kicked out? First of all, just real unfortunate luck. Like You hardly yeah. ever hit the pin, and then yeah. you hardly ever get a ricochet off yeah. the pin that goes that far, and then you hardly ever get a ricochet off the pin that goes that far that goes into water. Yeah. So he, he really got screwed there. But... I'm still confused about the rule. Like, he signed the scorecard. He admitted that he knew it was a penalty. He took a further drop than he needed to. 
The thing is, he didn't get kicked. He didn't get booted because the infraction got called in. Yeah. So, so just, that's, that's how does the, that work? Just any random person you can call in any, I can any call potential in. infraction you think. Yeah, if you know the number, which I I couldn't tell you. So any random head, person you can call, you can call, call in, in and say he hit a loose impediment. He should have got one stroke penalty. They review it. The officials review it, review it. If they agree, you get the stroke penalty. But usually they'll give it to you on the course. Yeah, they come yeah. up and they stop you and tell you this is what's happening. All right. So I mean, to get a two stroke penalty for that, I don't know. If this is somebody else, I don't know if they're going to get kicked out because obviously you want Tiger in it. But then the fact mm -hmm. lies that, well, I don't want this guy to win now because he's cheated. And he only got a two-stroke penalty. So should he have gotten a boot? I guess not. I think and I'm happy that he didn't is the, win. Cheating is the wrong word. Well, he, he admitted to taking the wrong, taking well, the no, wrong I draw. Think, I don't think I think cheating is too strong. I think he, cro he mixed up two rules, yeah. which in the heat of the moment – you're leading the Masters. You you think you hit a great shot. You get a horrible break. You're really just thinking, I want to hit the next shot close. He mixes up to it. I think cheating is the wrong the wrong word for this situation. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you there. It was just an unfortunate situation, and I'm happy he did not win. I'm not happy he didn't win because I think golf is better when Tiger does win. Well, he was and in I it. Thought this was, I thought this was his tournament to really come back. He's almost there. Obviously, he has to win a major to kind of finally be all the way back. I think the rules, of, from the explanation that we got from the rules official, I think they handled this in the right way. He, The drop is what it is. He said he dropped it two yards back, which you can't do, whatever. Someone called it in. They had that rule in place because it's unfair for guys like Tiger who have every one of their shots on TV. So every one of their shots has potential for someone to call in. All these other guys, some of these other guys, some of the lower tier guys who are never on TV, they could hit loose impediments or whatever, you know, mix up a rule like that all day. No one would know the difference. And because the guy just mixed up the rule, he would think I didn't do anything wrong. So those, it just goes unpunished. So it's that rule that they put in in 2010 is the right rule. And I think the key is if people call in, they should just disregard that to begin with. They should just not allow that to happen because yeah. it's idiotic. To, a, a random it's, human being? like It's completely it's moronic. Like so. I think they did the right thing. I think the people asking for him to withdraw after they've given up, given up for punishment, are the dumbest people on planet Earth. Because if you go to if you go to a courthouse and they say, "Well, well we're going to give you three years," you're not going to ever say, "No, nah, give me life." You're going to take your punishment, do it, and that's it. He took his punishment, made a mistake, didn't have any problem with the two-stroke punishment, which ended up kind of costing him because he was right in the mix. Two strokes, yep. he would have been lurking. I don't think he would have been in, at that nine under mark, but. So I think it was fine. I think they did everything right. And I think we're going to start seeing that call more if this happens in the future. Like stuff like this doesn't really happen that often anyways. But yeah, yeah. it's the onus is on the is on the master's committee, the rules officials, to go up to him during the rounds. And they didn't. So Okay. All right, Warehouse. So we're hopping on to our fifth topic here. NBA playoffs begin Saturday. Let's go with a 1 to 10. Like a 1. I didn't even know the NBA playoffs were starting this weekend. So that's just an in indictment of where I'm at in terms of the NBA playoffs. You think about it, they start Saturday. They won't end until June, sometime in June, which is far too long for anything, any sort of playoff situation ever in the world. Because when I think about it last year, what was I doing when the NBA playoffs were over? I was back full in, in the swing of working at Stowe Acres. It starts when I'm in school. Too long. Way, 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 way too long the NBA playoffs. I'm probably going to watch less than three games in this entire NBA playoffs, so I'm going to go one. All right, I'm going to give you two numbers here, and I'm going to go two for everything non-Boston Celtics related. Like, I don't care at all about the West. The Lakers are going to make the playoffs. They're going to lose probably in five games in the first round. So I only have to listen to Laker talk for about nine days on ESPN or any other outlet. Anyways, from there, I don't care. Celtics-wise, seven. You know why? They're playing the Knicks the first round, and I like the Celtics' chances. The Knicks finally had a good season. They're second seed in the East, and now Boston comes along. New York can't ever beat Boston, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Celtics in Madison Square Garden, all they got to do really is win probably one of the first two games, come back to Boston, win one of those two games again. Yeah. Even the series up, three-game series left, I think the Celtics' chances in that because New York, I don't know, I don't feel like they respond to the media well. 
Who knows what Carmelo Anthony is going to do? He's not somebody who scares me like Kobe Bryant or LeBron James does, where you got to look out for him at all times on the court. So I like the Celtics' chances. And then going from there, I mean, you can really get into it. Yep. The Celtics would play the Pacers in the second round. Then they'll play the Heat. And that will probably be disastrous. I don't think there's any chance that Celtics would get Yeah, five I think they're struggling six. against the Pacers as well. That, that, that could happen also. But I think this series is going to be tight, though, the, that first round series against the Knicks. They're playing pretty solid. No, no, no. It'll be, it'll, it'll be a good, good series. It'll, it'll be a good, good series. I actually may watch that. So Yeah, I just convinced So, you. yeah, that's about the only series I'll watch. So I said under three games, which even still I'll probably miss and not pay attention. So, yeah, I'll probably set the number at three. Yeah, I don't think I'll watch any NBA Finals because yeah. it's going to be – Heat probably versus the Thunder again, and we know how that's going to play out. Yeah, not interesting at all. Yeah, don't care. And then the NBA draft's like a week later. Yeah. So you're like, wow, what a transition. WNBA draft was the other day. Yeah. You want to throw a shout-out to anybody? Not specifically. Okay. Next topic. All right, what's a better watch here, NCAA ice hockey or NCAA bowling? What all right. they've been on recently? They were on Saturday at the same time, live, one on ESPN, one on ESPNU. You can probably tell which one was, was on which. Uh, shout out to Yale and to Vanderbilt. Had to rethink there who won the, the women's bowling because men's bowling is not an NCAA sport, just women's. Which is the better watch? I can watch hockey any day of the week, and I can watch bowling any Sunday for about a three-month stretch. So right here, it's really a toss-up. But I'm going to go bowling. And I don't watch bowling that much, but the emotion these girls get from bowling a, a strike, the coaches get into it. You, you've seen professional. You, you've seen Alan Weber. You know, is yeah, that the guy? Yeah, Pete yeah, Weber. Pete Weber. Pete Weber. Who's the Allen guy? I'm thinking of. Uh, I don't know. Okay. That's the so only. So Pete bowler Weber. I we know, know Pete Weber. The guy gets intense. So do these girls. And plus, they they have ridiculous bowling outfits on, polo shirt that goes past the elbows, with a skirt on that goes pretty much to the knees. And then some of the girls have one of these things on. You know, so yeah. they can bowl a strike better or something. So I'm going bowling. Plus, the NCAA Men's Hockey Championship was pretty much a route, whereas bowling is neck-to-neck -neck the whole way, pretty much. Yeah, I'm going uh, ice hockey here. Uh, bowling's a good shout, but I just I think hockey just as a traditional sport. A little more interesting. I watched some of the NCAA tournament. I didn't watch the final, but I thought that ice – I actually thought their Frozen Four this year and the regionals and stuff was actually pretty interesting. I flipped on, watched some of those. It's kind of cool, too, because you see some of the schools from Massachusetts, Merrimack, UMass Lowell, who – Aren't division aren't really division one anything else even though UMass will is eventually they're moving, moving to division up. one yeah so it's always nice to see schools like that around there especially like Merrimack there's only like nine thousand kids in that entire school they get like three quarters of that to go to hockey every ho home hockey game which is unbelievable fill up that entire stadium so I'm going NCAA ice hockey though bowling watched a little bit of it thought it was all right probably would never watch it again okay. but that's should that. bowling be a sport in the Olympics. Yeah, probably. You think so? Yeah, probably. I would say no, but if they happen to add it, I'd probably throw it above. It shouldn't be like ahead of wrestling. Like it, that's kind of yeah. like where it's at right now. Which eventually wrestling's gonna come back in, I think. But okay. when you you think about, it, there's a lot of stupid sports. Like if you try to put in, and then you look and say, well, you kick wrestling out, then it's like really not many sports. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, wrestling should be in. I don't know. The more sports, the merrier in the Olympics. I yeah. don't know why they had to kick it out. I mean, they yeah. kept in modern pentathlon over it. Because the second week of the Olympics is not that interesting usually. It's it's good, but it's not as good as the first week. Oh, so the first week kills it. They can make the second week a little better. So add more sports and see yeah. what sticks. Bowling you can do in pretty much a day or two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go on to this next topic here. All right. So if you watched the Masters coverage, which I know you did. Did. The number one team is Jim Nance, and if you watched it before 2009, Nick Faldo, post-2009, Sir Nick Faldo. So it brought the question to our minds, which athlete shall be knighted? Andy Murray. Won, won a Grand Slam he last should, year. He should already be knighted. Won a gold medal. That's enough, I think, in that country. They haven't won a Grand Slam in tennis forever if he wins Wimbledon obviously they might just knight him on the spot like they because yeah. the royalty's already there they're in the royal box so they might just yes. come down knight him right there he gets the big the big trophy and everything ton of money so that might happen on the spot I'm going Andy Murray makes a lot of sense next in line to be knighted I think his resume already is enough but Wimbledon would put him over the top even another Grand Slam title would put him over the top which he could get probably won't get at the French but Wimbledon Another U.S. Open title, perhaps. So, 
I mean, he won the Olympic gold medal at Wimbledon. Yeah. Wimbledon at the Olympics was phenomenal. Yeah. Really, really awesome touch. My turn? Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm going to give you a girl first because you can get none if you're a girl. Call yeah. it Dame. And I'm going with my girl. You know who that is? Jessica Ennis. Jessica Ennis, 2012 Olympic heptathlon champion. Now they're going to the decathlon in females. So, yeah. I mean, she's going to have to be a decathlon champion now. She's got to add three more sports to her resume. I'm going Jessica Ennis because she won the Olympic gold medal. So all of England loves her. All of Great Britain, excuse me. And she's also pretty attractive, which also helps out her ability to be knighted, I think. So she'll be called Dame Jessica Ennis for the rest of her life as soon as she gets knighted. Men's side, I'm going commentary. I'm not going, I'm not going to have athlete specifically. This guy, he does a little bit of boxing, does a little bit of football. I think you know who I'm talking about. Yep. Ian Dark. Yeah. He's a fan Everyone favorite. Everyone calls him Sir Ian it, that's now to begin Sir with. Sir Ian Dark just flows so yeah. well. Sir Ian Dark. Yeah. Like, I don't know why they're, what are they waiting for? I mean, yeah. maybe they're pissed at him because he's at ESPN now. It's yeah. an ESPN company. But he were, he probably still does boxing. I don't think his, I don't think that you can even hear him in, he, you can't hear him do a, a soccer game in England. If you're in England, I don't think, unless you have American ESPN. Yeah. Because they don't, it's like a different thing. All right. So, Sir Ian Dark, it just makes so much sense. I mean, if I could knight, if I had the powers to If America him, could knight people, he would get it. Yeah, I mean, America doesn't do that sort of thing. We would have so many athletes knighted. I mean, Britain has quite a few. Yeah. There's a Wikipedia list of it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's got to be a few people on there. There's only one tennis player, Norman Brooks, something like that. Yeah. So, Sir Ian. We already do call him Sir Ian. Sir yeah. Ian Dark. What would Ian do? He'd be knighted if I had the power. I, I do not disagree with that. So what we're going to do now is we got a little uh, video footage. Now, we did this last year. We talked about what our masters did and would be if we were Bubba Watson. And we said we got to so somehow we got to outdo what we did last year. So we got a little last video. Last year was pretty awesome. We got a little video footage. So enjoy this. Maybe get a, a notepad out because you may learn a thing or two here. Let's let's kick in this, uh, this footage we got coming from the outside. And uh, we'll catch you on the other side of this. This is the long-awaited moment. He won the Australian Masters just five months ago in November. He won the gold coat. Now he has this putt for a green one. Rick Eruption. I'm 2013 Masters Champion Jerry Ware. Part of the Rick Eruption. I'm Dan Charis, the caddy of 2013 Masters Champion Jerry Ware. And we're here in Butler Cabin to show you what my Masters dinner would be like. It's a three course meal starting out with a world famous taco dip. Dan, explain the uh, main course. Uh, the main course is a little bit of uh, pea pod slash chicken slash rice slash special sauce. And then we'll finish with a classic ice cream sandwich. So stick with us here in Butler Cabin. As you get a look in at the 2014 Masters dinner. Set the oven for 350. Throw some grilled chicken in the oven. Gonna start working on the taco dip. First step in a bowl, you're gonna, you're gonna combine sour cream, cream cheese, some taco seasoning. See what it looks like. Break this with my hands. Mm. Now we're going to stir all this together. Once the cream cheese, sour cream, and taco dip is all mixed up as best you can, you want to toss this all up in a nice pan like so. Once in this clear pan, you want to spread this out as thin as you can all over the bottom of this pan. Next step, dump in some salsa as your second layer. Then you want to spread this out once again, even on top of your cream cheese sour cream base. 
And we're gonna pop this chicken out that's been in here for about 15 minutes. Put that right on the countertop. Start shredding this chicken up so we can put this as the top layer right underneath the cheese on our taco dip. All right, now that we're all shredded, all we're gonna do is take this and start dumping this right in here, right on top. Final layer, nice, healthy, hearty, Trader Joe's Mexican blend cheese right on top. Cover this all up with cheese. This will melt down and really be a phenomenal top layer. With our layers all combined, we're gonna to toss this back in our oven, which is set to 350. Let this go for about five to seven minutes. Let that cheese get all nice and melty and gooey. And that dip's all done. After your five to seven minutes in your oven at 350, that's exactly what this taco dip is gonna look like. And that is, let me grab another. We can get the other side, but that right there is an appetizer. So we're here making the entree of this 2014 Masters dinner. We're gonna start off, throw some coconut oil in the pan, the rice. Yes, we use microwaves here in Butler Cabin. That's going in there. Special sauce, stir fried veggies, some grilled chicken. Gonna mix it all together. Maybe some pea pot action in there. There's your entree. All right, so step one here, you're gonna get your organic microwavable brown rice from Trader Joe's. Open up the microwave, toss that set down, three minute express cook, boom. So here we're gonna go, start our entree right here. Get a little coconut oil in there, get it nice on the pan. We're big boys here, we're gonna eat a lot of food, so we got a big pan going. Okay, let me get a little bit more of that. Mix it around right here on the pan. Make sure that melts. It'll melt eventually. Screw that cap back on, we're good. As you see, we're going to Trader Joe's pretty much the whole day. Great experience shopping there. Next step, the rice won't join us till later. You saw that rice come out of the microwave go in. First step, got some stir fried veggies. Dumped about half the bag out of there. We got some carrots, pea pods. I don't know how you feel about bamboo shoots warehouse, but they're in there. Love them. All right, get that going. We gotta get it steamed up. So what we're gonna do, grab it. Try to grab all the veggies you can, get them steamed up right away. I don't know if you can hear this, but this is the sound you want to be hearing. So take your top off right here. Your veggies are steaming, they're growing, they're doing their thing. But that's not the only step. We're gonna dump some grilled chicken in there. And when I say dump, we're dumping the rest of this bag. Let's go. Oh yeah, that's a lot of grilled chicken. A little bit more than I thought would come out of there, but we're gonna be good right here. What we're gonna do here again, we're gonna get this all in a nice pile. Hopefully we can separate the veggies at some point so we can just, just get the chicken steaming. That's not gonna do it justice, but it'll be cooked eventually. All right, so we got some of our chicken slash veggies steaming under this hair cap, but we've already steamed the surrounding chicken. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get, cut it up a little bit smaller, like so, so it can get steamed, cooked a little bit quicker, all right? All right, so we got our veggies, we got our chicken steamed, doing great things right here. We're gonna turn the, the old stove top down right now. We don't want it to get too cooked. But we're gonna add the special sauce right here, which if you go to Trader Joe's, it's called Island Sayaki Sauce, a unique teriyaki sauce and marinade for meat, poultry, fish, tofu, and veggies. So if you're a vegetarian slash vegan, you can also use this stuff. So we're gonna take it, you're just gonna eyeball it. And it makes a nice sizzle. You can probably hear the sizzle more than you can my voice. We're gonna get that going. Throw some of that in there. We'll almost clean the whole rest of the can of that stuff. Mix it around. You can smell the aroma in here. It's too bad you can't smell it at home. Warehouse can smell it on the uh, on the cameraman duty right there. Smelling good. Smelling good. All right, so I mean, it just looks great right now too, doesn't it? Doesn't it? it looks not? tremendous. Yeah, so we're gonna get that going. Might add a little bit more later if we think it needs it. 
All right, so we got the last step of our dish right here. I mean, the chicken just really soaked up that soyaki sauce. That's usually the rice's job. So we're going to dump this rice in right here. Brown organic rice. So you know it's good. That's what the chamois guy says. And I heard chamois blow us. So we got a lot of rice in here right now. Oh, yeah, that's dumped on there. So we're going to mix it around again. Oh, yeah. The rice has already been cooked. So no harm, no foul with the rice right here. But we're going to add some more soyaki sauce. We might just dump the rest of that in there. The chicken's disappearing now in the rice, and the veggies already disappeared in the chicken. But I just got some of my shoe. Other than that, throw some more of this in there. Probably just gonna dump the rest of it in there. The rice will soak it up. It'll be a nice dish at our master's dinner. Now we're working on the dessert, ice cream cookies. First thing, homemade cookie dough. Homemade by Toll House, not by us, but <laughs> homemade nonetheless. Get in there with a nice scoop, and we're just going to start plopping these down. Make sure you give them room, because as you know, these things are going to get hot. They're going to expand out. They'll be all on top of each other. Don't want that. You can probably fit about 8 to 10, depending on the size of your pan, so just be careful. See that nice room there? That's key. And we're just going to fill this pan up. We've got our oven going at 350, and we'll pop these in once we're all set. All right, we're going to pop these cookies in our 350 degree oven for about 15 minutes, but you want to be watching these things. Keep an eye on them as you get closer to that 15 minute mark. All right, these things are set to be pulled, and then we'll get these on a rack to rest and set up. Just popping these things off the pan, letting them rest and set up, cool down a little bit, and we're going to toss some ice cream on these pups. Okay. Now we're going into sandwich creation mode. We're going to flip this over, want to get that flat side, nice surface to work with. Pop some vanilla chocolate mix. Get that puppy open. And then we're just gonna get a nice spoonful, get a little bit of both. Put that right in the middle. Give you some room to really spread that in. Then find a matching size cookie, pretty simple. And we're just gonna keep doing that until we're all sandwiched up. Alright, you've seen our 2014 Masters dinners from start to finish, and I know we said we had an appetizer, but we just won the Masters and it's dessert time. Cheers. Almost as good as one in the Masters. We forgot to say beforehand, um, bon appetito. Tip your waiters, oh. and in this occasion, be you us. <laughs> Like I got no, I'm all right. I guess we're back. We're back. No, we are back. So this is what we made. You got the taco dip. You got the chicken dish with the pea pods, the brown rice, all that good stuff. That's our master's dinner. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you enjoyed that video. I have to shout out Tom Lima, solo job behind the behind the scenes today. Way to go, Director, Tom. cameraman, graphics guy, did it all. Brett Fourier showing up. This should be Show up by the tonight. Piece, I mean. This episode should be up tonight, so you should be here tomorrow on the steps right outside for St. Baldrick's Day. Donate a couple bucks. Donate a couple hundred bucks if you want. I'm not going to judge you, so thank you. What do you got to say now? What do you really got to say? Really got to say tip your waiters. This is actually really bomb. See you guys. <laughs>